Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Tan Cho Chuan, the president of the National University of Singapore. I'd like to warmly welcome you. Uh, and we really appreciate your being here on a Saturday afternoon for this Global Science Outlook. Uh, today, we are joined by a really distinguished panel of uh, speakers. Uh, on my left, we have uh, Patrick Abisher, who is the president of the uh, Swiss Federal uh, Institute of Technology in Lausanne. And then we have uh, Mariette uh, Di, Christ Di Christina, the Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American. We have uh, Neil Gershenfeld, the Director of the Center for Bits and Atoms in MIT. And then we have Subar Suresh, who is the President of Carnegie Mellon University. So maybe I'll uh, take a couple of minutes just to uh, frame the issues that we hope to discuss and also look forward to your comments and views uh, about uh, later on this session. And that is, uh, I'm sure that in the course of the last uh, four days, you've heard a great deal about the major global challenges that the world faces, everything from sustainability to climate change to health to aging. And I'm sure, too, that during the course of the discussions, uh, you would have heard a lot about the scientific advances uh, that uh, are generating potential new solutions. The good news is that uh, collectively around the world, uh, global R&D expenditure has actually more than doubled in the last 15 years and uh, adjusted for purchasing power parity. Uh, today, the world spends uh, 1.4 trillion US dollars annually on research and development. So that's a massive amount of money going into research. And about one third of this is in the US, a third in Europe, and a third in Asia. And a lot of this money is being spread across a wide range of areas. But more recently, of course, we have had uh, very massive investments in research relating to the brain and to the neurosciences. As many of you know, a lot of interest in uh, big data analytics, additive manufacturing, the ability to make things, and uh, also uh, in a whole range of other areas. So the topic we're going to explore today is, is this. Uh, what are the implications of this massive investment in R&D and the concomitant massive uh, output in knowledge and new discoveries? And how might the science, technology, all these discoveries transform or reshape business, society, the way we live? And uh, in particular, we would like to uh, consider what are some of the major trends and issues that could shape the global research agenda around the world and to gain insights into how science might alter the business landscape and influence global risks. So for the format, I'll uh, first invite each speaker to speak for about three or four minutes. Then we will uh, have uh, a discussion about some of the key points. Uh, we look forward to your questions and comments after that. Uh, and we're also uh, a live cast, so uh, we're also taking questions on Twitter uh, through hash SciTech, that's S-C-I-T-E-C-H, uh, from uh, an audience uh, from other countries who are uh, watching this uh, event today. So without further ado, I'll uh, start with Subra Suresh. Uh, and uh, Subra, you were until recently the director of the U.S. National Science Foundation. And one of the major initiatives under your term was... Uh, the formation of a global research council that brought together the heads of uh, many key research funders from around the world. So as a kind of overview, can you tell us from the perspective of major research funding agencies around the world, what would you say are the most critical trends and issues that are shaping the global science agenda today? Okay. Thank, thank you, Cho Chuan, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as, as the chair of this, this is the moderator, Dr. Tan, just mentioned, um, globally we spend about 1.4 trillion U.S. dollars on R&D. We don't know how much of it is R and how much of it is D, but nevertheless it's, it's R&D investments adjusted for purchasing power. Last year, according to the National Science Board Statistics, which is uh, the governing board of the advisory board of the National Science Foundation, last year for the very first time in the history of science funding, the top 10 Asian countries collectively invested more in R&D than the U.S. did. That had never happened before. The rate at which the one-third investment in R&D from Asia is increasing is significantly higher than the rate of research expenditures in the Western world at the present time. 
So given those trends, we need to ask the question, given the substantial investment in scientific R&D, it doesn't matter where it's being done, we have to make sure that collectively as a globe, we do the right thing so that science uh, thrives in the best way. So this is the spirit with which 50 heads of science funding agencies from around the world who collectively um, are in charge of a significant fraction of the global R&D met in Washington a couple of years ago, and they formed this uh, virtual organization called the Global Research Council. And if you look at the investments in R&D, there are two issues that um, come to mind very quickly. Many of the countries that are investing very significantly into R&D at rates that far surpass what the Western world does, take very small countries like Singapore and Qatar, or large countries like China and India, those that are relatively new to, the, to heavy investments in R&D, what can we collectively do so that the infrastructure for R&D, it's not just investments, but also the basic infrastructure, scientific peer review, ethics, research integrity, respect for and protection of intellectual property, migration of young, mobility of young researchers, open access to scientific publications, eventually open access to data that connects to big data and, and other topics that will come about. How do we make sure that there is at least a conversation? So two years ago, for the very first time, this group uh, of broad science and engineering funders uh, met in Washington. And subsequently, a decision was made that each year, uh, a developing country and a developed country will come together and uh, organize an annual event where the objective would be to take up two issues and at the meeting not talk about the two issues but finish two issues. That means the year before that you start coordinating activities from around the globe through regional meetings. The first year it was uh, development of scientific peer review and creation of the Global Research Council. The second year the meeting was held in Berlin, jointly organized by the German National Science Foundation and the Brazilian Science Foundation. There were two objectives, releasing a document collectively developed and endorsed on research integrity and a five-year roadmap on not only how to create an infrastructure among these agencies uh, for uh, open access to scientific publications, but also eventually how to pay for it. Uh, then the third meeting this year will be held in Beijing, um, uh, jointly organized by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the National Science Foundation of China in collaboration with the Canadian Research Funding Agency. And there are a number of countries that plan to uh, uh, move forward with this in coming years. Let me just close with a couple of uh, uh, themes related to this. One of the goals is also to look at the theme of this World Economic Forum is inequality. And this is a topic a lot of heads of states have talked about. There is a huge inequality in science as well, and access to knowledge in science. If you take Sub-Saharan Africa, so one of the things that the Global Research Council did very successfully last year, for the first time, 22 organizations from Sub-Saharan Africa were brought to this table with the leading science funders so that they could be at the table in conversation on how we can help them. And this was evident in the meeting in Berlin. So that's one of the objectives. The second objective would be to look at a five years ahead from now, and we are already doing a lot of things collaboratively, but on a case-by-case -case basis, whether it's telescopes in Chile, funded by the US National Science Foundation and European um, uh, Space Agency and so forth together, or it's CERN in Geneva, but they are focused areas. How do we take it collectively and elevate it to a conversation so that we can cover many different topics, including the Brain Initiative and so forth? So let me stop with that. Thank you, Subra. I think it's wonderful that the funding agencies from around the world are developing a sense of common language and a common understanding of some of these essential underpinning uh, issues uh, for global R&D. Can you say uh, a little bit about, uh, are there any patterns emerging about convergences in areas in which uh, funding agencies around the world are investing in? I mean, Well, so there are many, many successful examples already, but on a case-by-case -case basis and somewhat serendipitously. Um, in 1956, the National Science Foundation started a collaboration with Chile in, in the area of astronomy, land-based uh, telescopes. 
And that has led to wonderful policies on open access among many different countries between Europe, Asia, and, and the US, uh, and also NASA and others. Uh, that's one example. The other is the Antarctic program, the Antarctic Treaty, which now has 51 countries involved. And how do you do science in Antarctica? That's another example. CERN is a beautiful example in particle physics, high energy physics. Um, but those are isolated examples. So I think the brain initiative, which would be a very good area in which to explore further collaboration. What we have that's relatively new here is the recognition of big data as a, as a global challenge. Education across borders where even though funding is local, the access to knowledge derived from that funding is global with no barriers and no national policy as any um, authority over a global uh, action. And I think those are new things which we have not addressed yet. So this brings me actually to uh, Patrick Abisher. Uh, the research into the brain really is uh, often described as one of the most exciting frontiers of R&D in this century. And the institution you lead, uh, the EPFL, has just recently won a uh, 1 billion euro uh, grant on the Human Brain Project, which is coordinated by your university. Can you tell us a little bit, uh, Patrick, what do you think will be the longer term impact of this uh, massive investment in brain research? And uh, how do you think this might impact uh, businesses, policymakers, the way a society is functioning? Now, you, maybe you should, we should ask ourselves why is there for the first time, I would say, large initiative that are dedicated to the brain? And I would say there are potentially two. The first one, when you look at there's a huge need, you know, with the aging population, dementia, mental health, and so on, is becoming uh, uh, very prominent. At the same time, if you look at the record uh, of, uh, I would say, the biotech pharma industry, it has not been very successful in this area. If you look at the number of uh, you know, uh, FDA-approved drugs, if you look at cancer, you will see a lot of them. If you cardiovascular, you look at uh, brain disease, it's terribly flat. I would say it's mainly uh, remixing for migraine and a little bit of this. But for the big challenges, you know, pharma and us have not been successful. In the basic side, there have been a tremendous amount of data being generated but this is very, I would say, spotty. There was never an initiative that was trying to put all this together. On the other side, I would say, that why, why do we see those initiatives? Because new technologies are being developed that allows you to interrogate you know, some of the most difficult brain issues, brain science issues, certainly in the imaging, in the multi-electrode recordings. A lot of things are coming. In fact, when you talk about you know, the therapies, I, I like to remind my, my, my friend from Pharma that probably the most significant breakthrough of the last 20 years in, in for example, neurodegenerative disease has been deep brain stimulation. When you put an electrode in a very specific part of the brain called the, uh, the, 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 the subnucleus, uh, the subthalamic nucleus, and this is, has changed, literally, the treatment of end-state Parkinson's disease. Now, it's interesting, there was not a lot of science behind it. It was really one neurosurgeon, Mr. Ben Abid in Grenoble, that really looked at this and, and, and had the guts to some extent to go ahead and had a fantastic. But it shows that, in fact, we have to look at a much, much more, I would say, holistic approach to brain disease. And I think that's what is very exciting. There, there is engineering science coming you know, to play. Uh, when you go and record multi electrode recording, non invasive technologies, you need the IT power. All those kind of things allows you to revisit, to some extent, uh, uh, the brain. And I think that's why, and maybe for once, Europe was in the lead, and they've launched, launched those FED flagship project, and you know, we were, very, of course, very happy and to, 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 to receive, uh, not us, but it was Henry Markram that is leading at my institution, and this will be spread across many institutions. And so it's not one billion euro for EPFL, but one billion euro for the program. But it's true that about a third of the, of the money will be spent on my institution. So that will be also a very important factor for us. But I think what is important is now is to bring the engineers. For example, that we're doing, developing neural processes for, 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 for example, deafness, you know, for, for uh, vision loss and so on. There's a lot of things. Now, those fields have not worked really together. If you look at this, you know, the funding agency have been separated. There's often life science, engineering, basic science. Those are separate. So we have to learn how to put those things together. And I was very pleased to see that the Americans launched the Brain Initiative a couple of 
weeks, months after that was very visible with Mr. Obama. I understand that there, is, there will be maybe not as much money, but this is coming, uh, and I think this is important. And I think also I was very pleased to see that there was a session on it, that those things are very complementary. We're not talking about, you know, a, a race between Europe and the United States. But I think, for example, as I understand, the American program will be developing technologies that will produce data. The European project, which is much more on reverse engineering simulation, will be able to use this data generated to create a model. So I think this is, you know, this is man on the moon. It's even, you know, the International Space Station. And I think we should really look at it. And I've heard now that the Chinese will probably launch a major uh, brain initiative. The Israeli have launched one. So I think it will be a bit the decade, or even more than the decade, but certainly we will not resolve all this in a decade. But I think this is a very encouraging thing, that those sciences are converging, that's from a science point of view, that the agencies are ready to fund at the large level, at the big science level, which is very new. I think it's the second after the Human Genome Project of a big science in life science project. So we will have to be sure that we work in a very collaborative way. From the pharma industry, we need to have it on the devices company, the IT company. We see this convergence, I would say, this convergence of, you know, we call it nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, cognitive sciences merging. And I think this is only by this massive effort that we will be able to provide new therapies because those are, you know, very much needed. And I think this is, you know, being myself a neuroscientist, I think this is a very exciting time for this area. But I think we have to be sure that we do it in a different way, not in a one man, one ego, as I said, but really in a very integrated collaborative. And we need, you know, also... Uh, the company's help. And I think we need the IT companies, we need the farmers if we want to resolve those issues. So I think it has to be in an open way, uh, in an open, innovative way, and then sure, the companies will be able to take it on when it's needed. But I think this needs to be a very large international collaboration if we want to have an impact in this area. Thank you, Patrick. We want to move now from the brain to information. And uh, Neil, uh, today ordinary people like you and I get more and more information faster and faster. And maybe in the near future, ordinary people, at least like me, would likely be able to make many, many things by myself at home. So what do you think are the implications of these two trends? Uh, the ability to access information and to make things in your own home. I mean, where do you see this going? And uh, how do you think uh, this will... What are the implications do you think this will be for businesses and for ordinary people? Okay. So information is exactly the right word to say. Uh, th let me start by saying I'm delighted by so many people interested in science this late in the meeting and this late in the day. It's great to see this group. Uh, I would vote for the biggest ideas of the last century, Shannon digitizing communication, followed by von Neumann digitizing computation. Before Shannon, we communicated with analog signals. The heart of his intellectual contribution, which was in the best master's thesis anybody's ever written, he was at MIT, and you have to read his master's thesis if you haven't, where he invented digital. And the heart of what he showed is by using symbols, by adding information and then taking it back out, um, you can have an imperfect system, the telephone, but you can communicate perfectly. There's an exponential reduction in the error rate. That's called a threshold theorem. That was the intellectual contribution that led to digital communication. You wouldn't use an analog telephone anymore, we have the internet. Von Neumann did the same thing for computing. He showed if you com compute by manipulating symbols, the device can be imperfect, but the computation can be perfect. And again, it was a threshold theorem. Um, what they gave us was unprecedented complexity. You could detect and correct errors in the state and it gave us the unprecedented complexity we have in the internet in computing that's touched every aspect of science. So that's my vote for the biggest ideas from the last century. What's happening now, the new frontier is digital fabrication. That's not 3D printing. 3D printing was born in 1980. It's gotten a little faster and cheaper, but it's really nothing's new since 1980. And it's not computer-controlled machining. The MIT made the first computer-controlled machine tool in 1952. The real invention is actually four billion years old. That's when molecular biology evolved the ribosome. And it builds you with molecular Lego. You're not analog. You're built with discrete building blocks. If you think about Lego, they come in different colors. When you snap them together, they're more accurate than you are. And when you're done, you don't put them in the trash. You take them apart and reuse them again. 
That's how biology works. It's fundamentally digital, and we have the unprecedented complexity of us. A chemical reaction has a yield of maybe a part per hundred. The ribosome makes proteins with an error rate of about 10 to the minus four. DNA is replicated with an error rate of 10 to the minus eight. Incredible numbers, and that's because you can detect and correct errors. So in the research, the revolution happening now isn't 3D printing, that's decades old. We're actually learning how to put codes and computation into materials themselves. Trash goes away. Trash is an analog concept of materials that don't contain information. There's no trash in a forest floor. You disassemble and reuse. So we're learning to output cells. We're learning to make assemblers of chips. We're making airplane printers. Across the whole range of technology, we're learning to code the construction of functional materials, putting information in. So view this as fulfilling the digital revolution. We had one in computing. We had one in communication. We're now living through a digital revolution in fabrication. It's a science of putting information into materials, and it's going to change everything. That's the science. Now here for this session is the unexpected result. That's my day job in research. Um, NSF passed a rule that you have to measure social impact. We didn't have a clue how to do it, so we set up some tools in a community center because we thought that was more fun than talking about it. And that was just to shut the NSF up so we could go back to work. But accidentally, they went viral. And these fab labs spread all around the world. There's hundreds. They've been doubling every year and a half, giving people early access. If you think about mainframes to PCs, this is sort of like the mini computer period. It's not yet the Star Trek replicator, but it kind of lets you do it, just like the mini computers that invented the internet aren't yet the PC, but it let you invent it. So those have gone viral. But here's what happened. I realized as they spread, it was challenging the fundamental, sorry, um, existence of what I do as a day job. I love MIT, but it's based on a series of assumptions of scarcity. You assume the books are scarce, and things like edX and Coursera are putting the libraries online. You assume the people are scarce, and there's a number of platforms to share, real-time interactive video, things like that. And then you assume the tools are scarce. Only a few people can come use the tools. Digital, I didn't get this at first, but digital fabrication means personal fabrication. Personal fabrication means anybody can make almost anything, and that means once you have the base set of tools, you can affect, download the campus and make the scientific tools. And so it means there's some things at the frontiers of science and technology that needs massive investment, and only a few people can do it, that really need the cost structure and the space structure of institutions like CMU or EPFL or MIT, but a lot of what used to be done in those places can now be done in a much more distributed way. Not do it yourself by yourself, but by distributing the tools that let you bring the campus to the student instead of the student to the campus. And in turn, we're finding in war zones, in shanty towns, and above Arctic villages, all the places these labs have spread, we find exactly the same profile of the brilliant inventive people that get attracted to our institutions, but who would never be seen. And so for me, there's a series of dominoes that the research is digital fabrication. That means personal fabrication. When you connect it with digital computing and digital computation, it leads to a very different vision for the future of advanced research and technology, which isn't central, which isn't online, but is fundamentally distributed by bringing the tools to the people instead of the people to the tools. And so for me, the great hope for science and future you know, in the next century is the MITs and CMUs and EPFLs of the world fit a few thousand people. We have a few billion, we're off by a few orders of magnitude. We're going to end up using much more of the brain power of the planet as the impact of the change in the technology. Can you, uh, this is fascinating, can you maybe give us a very, very briefly a, 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 a practical example of uh, what do you mean by, you know, um, digital fabrication, uh, putting information into materials, for example. Uh, I, you have a fab lab here, so what can actually people do with this? Give, so, give us a real-life example. Yeah, quickly. so yeah, yeah. Yeah. let me separate yeah. two uses of the term, okay. if I could. So the deep use of the term is coded construction of discrete materials. So two quick examples. We have a project funded thanks to the NSF, and in fact, not only thanks to the NSF, but thanks to Subra through a program, the NSF will fund things that it would never otherwise fund, crazy stuff that he started that I'm very grateful for. And what we're developing is a tabletop assembler of integrated circuits instead of a billion dollar chip fab. And the way it works is by making microelectronic Lego, literally. Um, to make a chip fab today, you bake and cook stuff. Here what we're doing is making tiny little pieces, 
much like Lego bricks, but that are conducting, semiconducting, and insulating. And so to make an integrated circuit, a microassembler places these little blocks in three dimensions. And then, instead of e-waste, when you're done, you can take it apart and make another one. Likewise, we had a paper in Science a few months ago showing how to make the world's highest performance ultralight material by making uh, linking discrete little loops of carbon fiber. Instead of, if you've ever seen it, there are these giant airplanes that carry these giant carbon fiber parts made in these giant factories. Instead, we showed if you made little tiny loops and link them, you make a material that's actually much lighter and stronger. So we're making giant sort of robotic insects that snap together um, jumbo jets. That's the precise use of digital fabrication. The materials themselves are digital, not the design. The second half of the quick answer is, that's many years of research to get that out. Mm -hmm. Today, using the tools in the fab lab like we have on the terrace, um, one of, for example, in this session, we have an oscilloscope you can make using the tools in fab labs for a few dollars in parts. Another one of the examples we have in the lab you can come see after the sen session is an ECG monitor you can make in a few dollar parts. The ability to do additive and subtractive 3D fabrication, surface mount rework, programming embedded processors means all those pieces of lab equipment you can make in the fab lab here. It's not yet the reversible assembler, that's the science, but using the tools in the lab you can make the stuff like that. So making an oscilloscope or an ECG monitor for three dollars in parts means you don't ship those around the world, you ship these machines that make machines around the world and make those. And the, the last of the best examples you can come see in the fab lab is the machines in the lab a few years ago we had here were commercial. The machines we have this year are machines we made with the machine. So there's this nice recursion of along the way to replicators making replicators, we're using machines to make machines. So, uh, so Marriott, I, you know, all this is really exciting. You can, you can feel the sense of it, but uh, it's also not completely easy to understand. <laughs> <laughs> So we have, uh, you know, this science going on, the scientific community excited, uh, but probably a widening gap between the understanding of the science and its implications, between scientists, between policymakers, politicians, the public. So what do you think uh, we can do really to address this issue of bringing science in a more accessible way to help inform the public and policymakers so that we can work together in order to reap the, the benefits and advances from the discoveries. Thank you. So, first of all, it's great also, thank you for, for having us. It's great to see so many people in the room, and some people are even standing, which I, I feel sorry for you. But um, um, Seats Dr. over Gersh here. Yeah, there's seats over here. Dr. Gershenfeld's um, statements about tapping the billions around the world are really an excellent um, segue for me to talk about touching the public. Because, uh, of course, as we all know this, while there may be a trillion invested around the world right now, the great enabler of that continued funding will be to tap the goodwill and passion of the citizens of the world to appreciate what the benefits of this research will be, both for knowledge acquisition, and we've talked quite a bit about access to knowledge and what that will mean for the globe, and also for you know, things that are personally you know, immediately relevant, to cures for mental illnesses, let's say, or building things in, in different places. And communicating and connecting with the public is one of the ways to do that. So I want to frame up this just really quickly and then give you two enablers, because indeed, Dr. Tan, um, many of the things that we're talking about now, about um, connecting through digital platforms is the things that are revolutionizing the science, the information, are also revolutionizing our ability to connect with the public whom we ultimately do serve. So on the one hand, um, we've seen some unfortunate gaps in science knowledge. I mean, well-known effects of you know, some anti-science in some circles and pseudoscience, and there's been a great deal of hand-wringing and concern around proper education for a knowledge-based workforce in the future. And there are very good reasons to be concerned about these things. But as you know, a science journalist for more than 25 years now and at Scientific American, I noted a few interesting trends which I want to put out to you as reasons for hope and encouragement and to really encourage you, I hope, I hope I will convince you that it is worth your while to take this on as an individual endeavor as well as one that we can do collectively. And so what do I mean by that? Well. These days, thanks to access to this information through our various digital platforms, people are actually communicating more science, technology, innovation news than they ever have before. How do I see this? How can I prove it to you? Well, one tiny stat is just at Scientific American, um, you know, a magazine that's 168 years old. In the past three years, our online um, unique visitors to the site has more than tripled. 
Why is that? Well, partly because the major headlines of the world today are all underpinned by science. And we view it as one of the important things is to make connections for that public. But let me give you a couple of other things. Just a, few, uh, just a couple of years ago, the New York Times did a very interesting study with the University of Pennsylvania. And what they were wondering was, what do people choose to share? Of all the stories in the New York Times, it was a very general interest newspaper, what do they choose to share? And they studied several thousand stories and, and saw those the most emailed. You've seen them on websites. And guess what? The most emailed stories are not necessarily, although you might expect it, the stories, how do I buy a camera or how do I um, you know, find a right school for my kid, although those did exist. The most emailed stories were, were more profound than that. They were stories that touched people's sense of awe and wonder, and they were typically about science, research, technology, innovation. So don't think that the people are not interested. They are. Another thing, uh, Pew uh, did a national study, of, uh, also, this is also in the US, sorry, this is where I'm from, asking what uh, professions were mostly positive or mostly negative. 84% of the respondents said that science was mostly positive influence on the public. And when, we were at, when they further asked, um, did, did various professions contribute a lot or little to society? Science was, was number three after military and teachers. Um, you, as you might imagine, journalists were quite a bit lower. Um, so, so in the, in, but yet in the US at least, fewer than 20% of the people have ever met a scientist. So science is a country that few of us have had a chance to visit. Now uh, we come to your opportunity and ours collectively. I'm gonna suggest two things to you. One is you know, through, your dig through the digital platforms, of course we have a wonderful way to communicate. Um, we're doing it now, we're getting Twitter questions, we're, we're uh, reaching out on social media, and I would put it to you that as anybody who I is in these communities of technology, innovation, development, science, any medium which you like, you can use to your benefit. Yesterday at one of the sessions, Al Gore said, if you're having a conversation around um, some issue of climate, take the opportunity to try to win that conversation. You can do that too, individually. And as a group, we can do this in a couple of ways. So you might do it, let's say, write a letter to the editor. Let's say, volunteer for a school board. Let's say, advise a, a local policy leader. There are lots of things you can do, and it could be anything that you like. But the second thing, is to tap the passion of the people about science. And I'll give you, um, very quickly, a couple of ways that people have demonstrated that they're passionate. Maybe some of you have seen some of the sessions with Chris Lintod talking about Zooniverse activities. Do you know that more than, uh, and it's just a handful of years they've been doing this, these citizen science activities, so-called. These are activities where anybody without a degree can participate in some way acting as kind of a human social network to advance learning. Maybe they're looking at an image and, and judging something, or maybe they're acquiring uh, data out in, out in the world somewhere, a, a picture of an animal, something like this. More than 900,000 pe people are participating and have done hundreds of millions of bits of cataloging at this point for, for Zunivish right now. Um, Scientific American has a whale call song uh, identification called Whale.fm on our site in one month. They did years worth of work. So I put it to you that you have the ability, we have the ability collectively to tap these billions of minds, to Dr. Gershenfeld's point, to have them help advance science, research, technology, innovation, and to have them connect with this new country so that they will be greater invested in it and so that they can then help advance it. the research. Could, could I just add an illustration yeah, of that? Please, please do. Um, f f to illustrate, um, uh, my favorite little tiny local for me index of, of the way the world is changing is I started life as a nuclear physicist and last fall I wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs and it was an unashamedly technical piece on this emerging science of digital fabrication and there was a wonderful response from the policy community that this is the most important thing happening for policy. Uh, my brother Alan started life um, studying foreign policy and went off to Hollywood to make movies and he just published a piece in Scientific American <laughs> um, and it was on the, uh, the gamification of knowledge. And so the, what I learned from that is whatever you think you can't do science without thinking about policy, science couldn't be more important for the future of policy. But conversely, it means you can't do policy with thinking about science. The policy is the most important thing for science. And so we no longer have the liberty to pretend they're different worlds. They've now, the fact that we're, you know, we published in each other's journals means I think they've completely crossed. It's wonderful. Uh, um, so Patrick, do you want to say something? 
Well, Marriott, uh, this is wonderful, but uh, do you think people are having an unrealistic expectation of what science can do? Uh, and, and this has various implications, including uh, the fact that science and technology can solve everything, and with it to the neglect of social sciences, behavioral sciences. Right. This they, is the flip mean? side, of course, okay. right? They, they, if you have great trust and authority, um, then people might overtrust. Uh, and and, and I, I think that can be true in certain circumstances. But again, I think the remedy is invite them in. Let people see the process of science a little bit. And, and through such mechanisms that we have, all these digital platforms that we have, you have many more ways to touch that public and make that clear to them that, no, no, we can't, at the moment at least, cure the common cold, but we have some ideas about that or, or any a number of other challenges that we're facing, feeding the public in a sustainable way you know, as we're growing population and so on. So yeah, there might be some unrealistic expectations. There also might be some fear. Um, many of us have... Uh, you know, as although uh, you know, we've we've talked about the one trillion funding in many circles. Funding has been tight, but again, uh, I talked about advancing science through crowd activity. There's also Kickstarter and others advancing projects through crowdfunding. You can tap that passion, so and then you can use it as a, a vehicle to educate, to share, and you know, enhance access to knowledge. Patrick, you got yeah, <clears throat> no, I think you know this is wonderful to have all this. People understanding, been excited by the science, and you know, well, Neil, you present this, and I've seen the the the, the uh, exhibition and so on. Now we also have to to just put things in context, uh, and this is the beauty about engineering. And I'm heading an engineering school. You know, you can do a lot of things, wonderful and so on. We just have also to put in some areas. Let's say, and I'm speaking again for the brain area. This is a long, ta difficult task. And even if you get, you know, people when I said we could receive a billion euro, that's going to be this is immensely complex, okay? So, 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 so I'm just, uh, you know, a word of caution <laughs> that putting new therapies and so on is not as easy as putting, you know, a new toy left and right. Now, those technologies are going to be extremely useful, you know, to do some research, to do. So this is fantastic, okay? And we are using, and engineering is contributing tremendously. And I think, for example, in the prosthesis area, we will see new therapies probably faster coming than small molecules and so on. But just we have to realize that some of the science problems are awfully difficult. And if I look at neuroscience, you know, even though we're going to put pour a lot of money in, let's try to keep our expectation at a reasonable level, okay? Because that's a bit of a concern that I have sometimes, saying that science can do everything and we'll find a solution in no way and so on. Some areas, and I think specifically probably, and I think the farmers know this even more than anybody else, Finding new efficient therapies for brain disease is a very long task and difficult task. And we should just keep this in mind. So sorry, folks, no brain augmentation devices coming anytime <laughs> soon. Uh, too bright. And then I want to ask one quick question of the panel and then please uh, get ready with your questions, Subra. So the issue of public understanding of science and public support for science um, has three major issues currently uh, uh, because... So, so let me start with the first one. Uh, if you look at even major commercial successes coming out of science, I'll give you one specific example of this, that requires enormous amount of initial support historically from taxpayer funds. It doesn't matter which taxpayer it is. The beautiful example of that is GPS. We all have GPS in our mobile devices. Most of us cannot live without it anymore. How did it start? It was a defense project in the U.S., uh, Defense Department supported it, primarily during the Cold War and the Soviet Union. Then from the 1960s to the 1990s, the National Science Foundation funded, along with other agencies in Washington, Department of Energy, DARPA, and others, basic science in mathematics, physics, computer science, before there were departments of computer science in universities. If those investments had not been made by the federal government in the U.S., you and I would not be carrying our mobile devices, and having all the benefits today. That's the first point. My own institution, Carnegie Mellon, played a critical role in the evolution of this. Most of the funding for research at Carnegie Mellon came from the federal government. That's the first point. The second point, if taxpayers are going to make major investments in basic research, given the globalization and the equalization of the world through the internet and so forth, the question naturally arises, we all want to collaborate, which taxpayer is going to pay for what? 
That's a natural political tension. And that's why it's very important to have conversations. If you have too much inequality, that question is going to become louder and louder. The third point, the last point I want to make, is that what are the consequences of science for the benefit of mankind? Equally, what are the unintended consequences of science for the benefit of mankind? Something I mentioned yesterday in another session, let me repeat it in the context of science here. The National Academy of Engineering in the US released in 2000 the 20 greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century. Basic things like electrification, aviation, creation of the internet, uh, nuclear power, refrigeration, air conditioning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Five years later, they produced another list called the 14 Grand Challenges of the 21st Century. So if you look, put the two lists side by side, you find something very striking. The greatest achievement, achievements of the 20th century have also given us some of the 14 grand challenges of the 21st century. If that is the case, what, is, what was missing? What was missing? Some, some people would argue what was missing was that while we focused on science and technology, perhaps we did not focus enough on the human condition. In other words, the integration of social and behavioral sciences with natural sciences and engineering. And that's going to be a key thing for the future. I want now to turn to the audience, uh, and uh, we welcome your questions. Uh, can I just ask you to uh, tell us your name, uh, institution, and kindly keep your questions short. Just one question here, please, the gentleman here. Uh, please have a mic and uh, tell, tell us who you are. Hi. Hi. I'm Anant uh, from India, Bajaj Electricals. My question is to the entire panel. In terms of this uh, investment in R&D is a very large topic because there's a government and non-government part. So how do you ensure the correct level of investment to in, so that the research doesn't get hampered and you basically get the end customer what you are trying to create for? Could, could I take a stab at that? Sure, please do. Yeah. So um, something that drives me crazy is research is managed as if it's ready, aim, fire, but the practice of real research is ready, fire, aim. <laughs> Um, and to say that carefully, it, if you have a milestone roadmaps and you know where you're going, it's not research. Research is a biased random walk. But ready, fire, aim means all of that. You have to get ready, then you have to aim, and then you have to, you have to fire and do something. And then the aim part is to figure out what you did. So Vannevar Bush at MIT wrote a very influential report about the endless frontier that I think was a great disservice. He described basic research leading to applied research, leading to development, leading to products as a pipeline. Any important project I've ever been in, it's all mashed up. That the most basic things I've done have come from being applied and the most applied things from being basic. And so I, I see the most important thing missing in managing the research portfolio to get benefit from it to society is not to more tightly specify the goals, but to more aggressively do the aiming part after the fire part, to figure out who's solved what and what's the benefit for it. And over and over, and I don't think we have time, I can give you many stories of this, but I was trying, asked to develop better shoplifting tags and I developed a quantum computer instead. And I developed a quantum computer that um, didn't scale efficiently, but it was a better molecular detection sensor. Each of those examples the transition from the research to the benefit to society and the application involved a collision of unlike people. It, it doesn't happen by being working by yourself in the lab. You need to bring the communities together. So I think the heart of that isn't to more tightly constrain the scientists. It's to more broadly engage the communities to find the value. Manage the mess messiness. Uh, Francis, Mike here, please. Yeah. Hi, Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health in the United States. Here we are at Davos. Uh, some of us have been coming uh, to these meetings for some time. I think my first one was maybe 1996. And it is gratifying to see science on the program. And here we are talking about the global science outlook. And I don't think we had sessions like that 10 years ago. But it still seems to me uh, when we come to Davos, uh, there are a lot of discussions going on that have enormous import for the world uh, relating to business concerns, political concerns. And almost all of those have science somewhere deeply ingrained in the decisions that need to be made. And yet, even now, in 2014, as far as we have come, it still doesn't seem to me that we have fully integrated the scientific information that ought to be 
informing those decisions. So I guess I'd just like to ask the panel, sort of challenge you, what, what are we doing wrong here that, that we haven't yet managed uh, to insert this kind of uh, scientific perspective as effectively as in an ideal world you would want to see the case? Because we're making progress, but we're not there yet. Terrific question, Patrick Abishon. In a, sure, but I, but I think there's hope. <laughs> I see first that it's, uh, you know, we, we're late on Saturday. The, so, the, 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 the room is full. I see very important part people from the business. <laughs> you know, the future chairman of Roche being sitting here. This is important. It shows for me we've never seen the people at the company's level and so on. So things take time. But I think it is very important that we bring the policy people, we bring the people from the business. So, but we also have to make an effort to make science attractive, understandable, you know, reachable. Uh, because we have a lot of our jargons, then we often lose our, our audience in two minutes. It's very easy to do it. So I think it's, you know, it, it's a bilateral thing. But I, I see this as, as something that is moving in the right direction, as you were saying. Science is on the agenda now. We have sessions, I'm looking at it, that have been well attended on the science. And I start to see people from the other community being present. So I think this is now, how do you transform this? And I think it's also that they start to realize the business are going faster and faster. If you not keep up you know, your science and your investment, you're losing your business. There's, there's a lot of disruptive technologies that are arriving on the horizon. And I think the business people are starting to realize that they have, the CEOs and the chairmen and so on, have to be somewhat aware of what is coming up. And I think this is already a first good step. On the other side, I think we have to make an effort to try to understand their needs, their way of looking at the world, to talk to the policy people, to integrate the policy, and not being the science, you know, we are a bit like Nile, Nile just pushing a little bit. <laughs> so give us money, we know how to do what is best, we're bright, something will come out useful. It doesn't always work like this, the, man, you know, the world. This is a bit the tradition of the science, you know, test. We as university president, when we came to this job, start to realize that, you know, we have to speak to the other communities if we want to be efficient. Subra, a quick one. I think that's a very good point, Francis. But here is another suggestion I would offer over and above what Patrick just suggested. If you look at this panel, um, the three of us are university presidents that receive, the universities that receive a lot of science funding from federal agency, former head of a science funding agency. You are a science um, funding agency or uh, health funding agency head, and we have a science editor and a scientist. What we need on the panel, in addition to some of us, is the CEO of a company who sits here and says, without science, my company will not be profitable. And we need some policy makers to hear that, hear that message repeatedly over and over again. No other forum has the bandwidth to do this than the World Economic Forum. I think, and I think if we do that, the, if we had the CEO sitting in the audience, sure, some yeah. of them also here, I think that message will be even louder. We'd like to hear from any CEOs in the audience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but maybe uh, first from this gentleman in the front row. Uh. My name's Alex Edmonds from the University of Pennsylvania and London Business School. So I'm a professor of finance. It's been truly enlightening to come to a science session. My question is, what do you think will the research environment be like in 20 years' time? So a couple of days ago, we had open forum about these massive online open courses, the idea that this will squeeze some of the smaller research universities and maybe reduce the number of professors that are available to do scientific research. So what do you see as, as the future within research universities? So will research be like what yes. Neil described? Go ahead. Continue to be like that, it will be something completely different process, Patrick. Yeah, I think so. And I think, again, this digital world is changing. I'm quite convinced that the way our institution will work will be different in 20 years. Certainly, we see the education where there's a bit of a hype, but certainly, you know, this online MOOCs and so on, bit in a way or another, will transform. I've spent the last six months going to Africa, and I see this massification of education. This is the only way. So this online will. I don't know exactly how, but it will. I think what uh, Christine said, it was also interesting about the research. We see now a lot of this crowdsourcing getting into the field. Certainly, we talk about astrophysics in life science, in protein structure and so on. We start to see in the general public. So what will be the boundary between our own institution, you know, even on education. We've started on MOOCs, it's true. You know, we have 10,000 students on campus and 400,000 that took, you know, courses in one year. So where is the limit? What is the people that we have outside, virtually, on site, physically? 
But I think we, we, we start to accept this from the education. But I think what we haven't totally realized that part, not all, but part of the research will potentially be done outside. And this is access to information. So access to the data will probably change the way we can do part of the site. You will still need laboratories where you do experiments and so on. But part of the, I would say, in silico research is going to be done potentially outside the traditional institution. So I think it'll be fine for the MITs, the Carnegie Mellon, the PFL. If you are the University of Nebraska or Neuchatel, it's with God knows, I think this is going to be a challenge. Well, I think uh, just to expand on the point and picking up on something said here, first, we are seeing a blurring of the lines between the experts, the scientists, and so-called lay people, right, through citizen science. And also the tools, as Neil has said, that the tools are becoming eventually more commoditized. So just as the, the, the PC has changed the way people talk about computing and made it possible for small groups, even individuals, to do science and research in their homes, so too some of the tools of the future and, and so I, I, enable I that. Right? Pick up, I think the internet architecture yeah. is a good model. The old MIT was like a mainframe. You went there and got processed. MOOCs, which I'm not a fan of, are like time sharing. They're still the mainframe and you're a terminal connected to it. Millions of isolated people clicking, that's not an educational environment. What's emerging that's so exciting are, is a network, an internet, where students have peers and work groups with mentors, with tools, who you then link by video. And rather than either or, the internet has a natural hierarchy. There's leaf nodes, there's local routers, there's high bandwidth core routers. In the same sense, this puts great evolutionary pressure. So MIT or CMU or EPFL have to justify their existence. And maybe just physically, half technically of what's done at MIT could be done in the fab lab on the terrace, half couldn't. And so you have to justify why that other half needs the cost structure of MIT. But it's not either or. What you get is sort of an internet of education. You get this kind of multi-scale link structure emerging. So I consider MOOCs today to be like the bitnet time-sharing phase, and what we're moving to is a sort of a distributed internet phase, a network education. So we have a question here, and maybe we'll take one uh, here too. We'll take two questions. Please go ahead. My name is Al Gora. I'm a venture capitalist from Israel and Pitango, and also initiating a startup uh, that helps researchers collaborate around the medical imaging. And my question is, um, we heard that uh, the world is investing 1.4 billion or trillion dollars trillion. per year in research. Um, so part of the question is how much of this money you think is not invested well because researchers are <laughs> doing the same type of work, getting multiple grants and uh, b basically wasting the brain power on, uh, because they are not collaborating. The other part is what part of this 1.4 trillion is biased by companies like the cigarette conglomerate that used to fund research just in order to spread a lot of uh, article and research that cigarettes are basically healthy for us. And okay, terrific question. So maybe you take a question from this gentleman in pink and, and the person there. So maybe at the person back, since you got a mic, yeah. Uh, Andre Hoffman from Um I, I've heard very clearly the challenge from the panel saying, you know, we should be meeting different community. The CEO should express their views and you should have people sitting there. I'd like to return the challenge to the scientists. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, science would be more useful, useful, in particular, more usable in setting policies if the scientists were able to back their provisions. I'm taking as an example the climate change. The two, the two and the three results of the big study which conducted by the United Nations gave us a range of prediction. If you ask scientists individually, in private, they will tell you this is serious. If you read the report, it's watered down. So if you really want to take an active part, if you want society to recognize scientists as being participants in policy, you need to back up these things and you need to be more assertive in your declarations. Can I respond to that? Uh, well, let's take one question oh, before. Uh, uh, this gentleman in pink here. Uh, and I think I just extend your question and not to overclaim too. Yep. Uh, to back their claims, but not to overclaim, yep. right? Uh, please, go ahead. Yes. Um, I'm Juan Garrido from Lima, Peru. I have... Uh, very simple question. Uh, countries like Peru and underdeveloped are way, way, way far back on what you're into. So not only in education, but in research and development. If you can tell to the developing world two or three things that you have to do to catch up, what would be? Okay, so let's take the first and third questions together. Maybe I'll ask Subra since uh, the data cited came from your uh, NSF uh, data. So is the money well used? Uh, all 
this 1.4 trillion and for the developing world in particular, I mean, what can they do, what can they learn to be more efficient and effective in the science and this translation? So if you look at just the history of science, it's not just one step, one discovery somebody makes and then it solves a whole set of problems and then we move on to the next one. It's not like a three month reporting in a business cycle in a stock market. It's an incremental progress. The way it works is somebody makes a, somebody does an experiment, has an interpretation or a theory, makes a claim. Other scientists try to reproduce it. Some of them work, some of them don't work. Some of the interpretations are wrong, but data are correct. In some cases, the data are not obtained under the right condition. It's not because the scientists are fraudulent, but because human interpretation is subject to, it's like expecting all, um, um, banks to operate at the highest level, levels of efficiency, all governments to operate at the highest level, levels of efficiency, all human beings to be ideally perfect. It's so scientists are no more perfect than any other human beings. I think we have to take that into account. Secondly, take the long-term view that science is mostly an incremental process and, and it comes by an iterative process by teams who challenge one another, prove one another. I think we have to make sure as scientists that we don't overclaim uh, we don't misinterpret and state things truthfully and factually. So that's the that, that's the first point uh, on that. Any so other? I, I asked Patrick, and then after that, Neil. For the, for the second, like maybe, maybe for, okay, for yeah. developing countries, yeah. very important, the most important thing, connectivity, okay. bandwidth, and then you have access to things. And I think I've, looked, I've traveled the last six months in Africa. You know, there's making progress, but the bandwidth is still not there. They go, I've seen young kids going to cyber cafe, this is the only place where they have access. You know, the campus are not yet connected. They don't have the bandwidth that they need. The day they have this, you know, human intelligence has a normal repartition and, and they're thirsty. They're probably even much more thirsty than, than we are. So I would say the most and more important thing is connectivity. And you, a quick okay, one, please. So to, to the climate change question and related, I work very closely with the physics caucus of the US Congress, which is Rush Holt and Del Foster. <laughs> There used to be three people in it, but Vern Allard is retired. Being a physicist in Congress is very painful because the problem is almost all of their colleagues don't understand inference. They don't understand probability and statistics. And the problem is there are problems where fundamentally from the science you can't be precise. What the science tells you is you can't be precise and you need to understand probability distributions. That's the battle they fight. It's a very difficult one. So the conclusion is not you need more precision where it doesn't fit. It means you need more people who understand imprecision. And I think the best route to that is to get more people who understand science and technology to do what Bill and Rush has done and go into public service and making that an easier route. The, the level of scientific expertise in the US Congress is appalling. <laughs> no, seriously appalling. Uh, not believing, not understanding very basic rules of inference. And we can't expect good policy unless the policy makers know more science. And I don't think we can teach them. I think we need to get more scientists in the system. Okay, Mary, how do you yeah, explain just a, precisely? Yeah. Just mm. a quick addition to that. I think there's a bit of a language problem. I mean, the way scientists speak about things is simply not the way people casually use things. I've had it thrown in my face so often that evolution is a theory. Uh, you know, when a scientist speaks of a theory, this means that there's a lot of evidence, and the theory is the supportive and predictive outcome of that evidence. It is not just somebody's idea. You know, and, and so I think on the scientist end of things, in terms of education, sometimes they have to learn to explain what it means that they provisionally accept something or, or how far to actually take that. But the backup actually is there. Well, uh, I'm afraid uh, we have one minute left and I will just maybe uh, want to share uh, three personal takeaways from this, uh, from this very rich discussion. First, uh, that we are seeing actually uh, great moves and uh, positive moves towards greater collaboration across countries in research, uh, certainly already occurring at the researcher level, but now at the level of uh, research funding agencies. The second is uh, convergence of uh, uh, research across disciplines under the umbrella of uh, big science initiatives. Uh, we heard about the uh, neuroscience initiative, but I think the point raised uh, by several speakers, and especially uh, Subra, uh, is really the need for us to include the human condition, the integration of social sciences, behavioral sciences, and cultural issues into this research so that we do can inform the technical ideas with uh, the ones that link to, to societies. 
Uh, and the third uh, is uh, about uh, uh, reaching out to the public and policy makers, uh, making sure that they understand what is coming out from this massive investment in science, its long-term nature, its uncertainty, but it's also its long-term importance in uh, advancing society and economies. And finally, uh, the future of research. It's hard to say, but there could be uh, quite substantial changes brought about by the ease of flow of information, of technical equipment, and uh, the blurring of lines. Uh, so that a greater inclusiveness of people who may not be card-carrying scientists. So with that, I, I, I think you would agree with me that uh, our panellists have done a tremendous job at uh, 4.30 in the afternoon on Saturday. I'd like to invite you to thank them. Uh, thank, you. thank you.